Okay. I'm Marge Christie I'm with the program committee. Glad to have you here. Um, before I introduce Kurt, I'm going to tell you about next week, as we always do. Uh, so next week will be Bill Morris, cartographer, speaking about the meaning of maps, and that will be here at the Senior Center. And then just as a reminder, on March 20th, which is not on your program, unless you've got one of the corrected versions, there will be a talk. It's the talk that was scheduled for February 13th that got canceled because of the weather. So refugee counselor Anna Wetlin will speak about refugee resettlement on March 20th, here also. Weather? There was weather this week? <laughs> Imagine that. No. Uh, and just a quick question. We asked it last week, too, but maybe there's some different people here this week. You've probably noticed, if you've been coming regularly, that this year, for the first time, we're having all of our programs here at the Senior Center in Montpelier. We used to have pretty much half and half, half here and half in Gary. So I just wanted to show of hands how many people would like us to continue. The first question will be, would you like us to continue having the programs here in Montpelier? And then the second question, would you rather we switch back and go half and half? So how many would like us to continue here in Montpelier all the time? Okay. And how many would like us to do half and half, half there and half here? Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, Kurt Fanta is here with us. Kurt was born overseas, speaks four languages, which I can attest to because we talked a little bit French and he showed me his expertise in three others. <laughs> Uh, he has a background in mechanical engineering. He was an elementary French teacher for a while. Um, worked in recycling for a while, and then found his way back to nature. Uh, worked at VINS, uh, or volunteer, I guess, at VINS as a classroom volunteer for outdoor education, and is now the founder of Exordium, an outdoor education organization which offers nature-based science, hands-on learning, uh, to the young and young at heart. So, welcome, Kurt, and let's hear about honeybees. Thank you. <laughs> so, I just want to let you know that I'm a very shy guy, so um, <laughs> please, if you have questions, go ahead and shoot them. Uh, but I had a mentor that always said, before you had a crowd, and if you were really scared about talking, tell them a joke. So I have a joke. <laughs> Very appropriate for older people like myself. Uh, so the joke is that when you're married for 50, 60, 70 years, and you get in a car, usually within five minutes, you don't talk very much anymore. You might <coughs> at each other, right? And so this was exactly what happened with this couple. And after 15 minutes, they were just <coughs> at each other. And she's looking out the window. And he's driving and clutching the wheel. And they come by this field with jackasses in it. She gets this little smile, and she looks at him and says, your relatives? <laughs> <laughs> yes, my in-laws. <laughs> and without further ado, I'd like to invite you to uh, talk about the honeybee. Thank you for having me come. Uh, I started uh, the, I was the original chairman in the St. Albans, Ollie. Uh, way back when they first started this program, so I know how interesting it can be and how valuable for our community. Um, and I've written several uh, nature-based programs to allow you to come out into nature and understand some of the things that, that are behind the topics that I have. So we're going to talk about our smallest domesticated immigrant, the honeybee, because that actually, the honeybee actually came from Europe. Um, and the honeybee um, creates harmonious colon uh, colonies that all work toward a common goal. And they can be anywhere from 20,000 to 80,000 bees in a hive, depending on how vigorous, how good the food, and how you keep them. Um, so we're going to be talking about a, a whole bunch of different things. And I'm also going to be touching on um, the wasp and other bees, the native bees. So in the world, there are over 20,000 different species of bees. And the major honeybee families are between seven and nine, depending on how you count them. 
And we also have, I'm sure you've heard about the Africanized bee, killer bee, and that they're coming up from South America. Um, so the only reason, it isn't actually more venomous than another bee, than the honey bee, uh, nor is it uh, you know, have a bigger bite. The reason it's called the killer bee is because it will follow you for a quarter of a mile if you disturb it. Whereas the Italian honeybee does 33 feet and gives up, right? So that's why they're called killer bees. The bees are found in every, on every continent except for Antarctica because there are no flowers or pollinating uh, plants there. Uh, so in every habitat that does uh, uh, contain pollinated flowering plants, the bee would be found. And that word is far too big for me to uh, pronounce, but that's the study of bees. And these are some of the uh, native bees that we have. And you can see from the, thank you. And you can see from the, um, from the names that those are actually, some of the names actually tell you the action that they do. For example, up here, this is a solitary bee, a leaf cutter, and it's cutting the leaves. That's its food. Bees are uh, herbivores whereas wasp, uh, wasps are coniferous and will, are not coniferous, carnivores. So we'll touch on that a little further on down. The mason bee actually creates uh, pots out of, uh, pots where it puts its uh, eggs in out of mud. And so you can see um, there's a whole variety of bees. I've just shown a couple that you might run into here in Vermont. <laughs> And then the cuckoo bee, aren't they beautiful in color? Yeah. So the cuckoo bee is actually a parasite and will lay eggs in another bee's nest. Not the honey bee, bee's nest, but other solitary bees. Where do they live? They live here in, uh, in um, uh, sorry, they don't live here. They live in uh, the tropics. But beautiful. And actually, I, I might have to, certain types of parasitic bees and I'm not sure if they're cuckoo bees, but um, might be here as well. Because everybody makes use of something that's free. <laughs> so the bee that we're going to be talking about is the honey bee. Um, they're organized, they're industrious, they're intelligent, and um, they're eusocial because they have a single female, a uh, fertile female, that uh, creates all of the other um, inhabitants of the hive which are uh, workers and drones. And she organizes them um, also uh, with her pheromones. Oh, modern technology. Um, so this is, uh, these are the topics that we're going to touch on as we go through the talk. Um, and I hope to uh, dispel or add to your knowledge of the honeybee. So the honeybee is perennial, which means that it will live from year to year through the winter. It does not hibernate. It is actually alive. And um, it, what it, it doesn't come out of the hive, obviously. But within the hive, it is always awake and, uh, and keeping the, the queen warm. It's a vegetarian as opposed to the wasp that is a carnivore. So the carnivore, and, and everybody says, well, what's the use of a, a wasp. I, all it does is sting me and it's around where I mow the grass. Um, the importance of a wasp is that it eats all of the bad pests that are around, such as uh, caterpillars and harmful uh, garden pests. And the other thing, uh, who's seen those purple boxes that are hanging around on trees during the summer? So those are for catching TAB, um, pests that are invasive, uh, emerald ash borer. And what they've done is, that's a passive track, and they're hoping to find that the wasp comes to a, or the, the EAB comes to a lure. But what they've been doing lately is they've actually been using wasps to go out and hunt the larva and bring it in. So it's a more proactive way of doing it. And scientists here in Vermont, I've seen them around on sandy fields, trap the wasp and then see what they bring in. And it should be a more proactive way. So wasps, although they people hate them uh, for stinging, are very uh, good. 
Uh, and the bee creates new colonies through swarming. We'll touch on that too. I actually had this, this is a tree that was actually in front of my uh, house. So it's a pine tree, has a hollow in it. If there's a, uh, a rock that they have a hollow, they go and they create this natural abode. Uh, okay, modern technology. So the colony that's within that hollow is one queen. There's always only one queen per colony. The drones are male, stingless, light, slightly larger. And then the worker bee, which is a uh, unfertile uh, female. The queen is the only one that is fertile. And we'll get into uh, the various characteristics a little further down. So within that hollow, they create combs, and I have on the desk, I actually have a natural comb. Most of you probably recognize the square comb that uh, they create uh, within a frame that we as beekeepers have, but if they're left to their own devices, they form a sort of a, a hanging, um, double-sided comb. And uh, in nature, uh, if the temperatures are good enough and, uh, and we don't have weather like we have here in Vermont, then they'll actually hang the combs out in the open air and uh, without any protection. protection. So the honeybee, um, there are several races. Uh, as I said, the Italian and then uh, all of these come from different areas in uh, Europe, and the Russian is actually a hybrid of the Italian, Carnelian, and Caucasian. So the Italian, just like its name, is a very gentle bee that uh, has large hives, is not very aggressive, loves to dance and eat pasta. Listen. <laughs> And the Russian, on the other hand, and this is not political at all, but the Russian is far more aggressive, but it can overwinter better. And so these bees have been bred for certain areas, for certain heights, for certain um, attributes that they have. So if you look at a honeybee, it is an insect. An insect has three body parts, uh, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Uh, it has six legs, um, then it has a stinger. The spiracle that you see uh, mentioned here are actually the breathing tubes that are in its abdomen. The thorax in the middle has the wings, and it has four wings. It has a hind wing, wing and a forewing, and then it has five eyes. Uh, Oh, by the way, I was supposed to mention there's a test, so I hope you take that. <laughs> so the compound eye, they have two compound eyes, and then they have three oscillae on the top of the head, and we'll see more of it uh, later on. They also have two antennae, a jaw, and a tongue, or proboscis. So these are the heads of the various um, bees. And you can see, so the worker has to collect nectar and uh, pollen. And so it has a very long tongue to be able to reach into the flowers. The drone does nothing except for chasing the queen. So he's got big eyes. <laughs> and the queen gets treated royally, doesn't have to do a lot of work other than lay eggs, and so she's basically in the hive. Once she's made it, she never leaves the hive. And the head contains uh, glands for the royal jelly, which is, uh, we'll see a little later on, is the food that uh, the worker bee feeds to larvae to create queens. And um, then also um, the queen, um, uh, or I'm sorry, the glands in the head also uh, create the pheromones with which they, they communicate. And the bees communicate through their antennae. 
so they touch each other and they let them, they have a chemical signal that goes between, between them. So here's the, um, here is the wing. So this is the thorax, the middle part. And you can see that the wing has a little zipper on it right here that when it's flying, it closes up. Now look at the wind beats. Wow. 173 per second. So that's why it buzzes. And the spiracles are um, little holes that allow it to uh, breathe. So it has tubes that go into its body through which it breathes. And you'll see, we'll talk about this a little later on, but uh, part of the challenge that the bees have uh, are the mites that actually go into those spiracles. And then uh, the legs, six legs, um, they're specialized too. The front are used to clean the body, the middle ones to walk and pack the uh, pollen. And on the back, one, uh, back legs, they have pollen baskets. And we'll talk about those in a little bit too. You'll see some pictures. <laughs> That's the arsenal. <laughs> so the stinger, is contained in the uh, abdomen. It has a venom sac, which is this purple. And here it's got a little pump in that venom sac. And what happens is it takes the muscle, thrusts that barb into whoever is attacking, and notice that the, they have barbs on it. And so it goes in, but it doesn't come out. And as it doesn't come out, this whole thing is torn from the bee. So a honeybee, when it stings, actually dies. Um, so if you think about it, um, unless the danger is quite large, the honeybee doesn't want to sting because it'll die. Um, and the venom is quite, uh, well, well, I'll show you what it's made of. So here's the stinger. And if you do get stung, the first thing you want to do is get the stinger out because the muscle will continue to pump, push on the venom sac and will continue to pump even though the bees die. And so the way to get the stinger out is to take a credit card, see they're good for something, a credit card and just wipe across it and it'll pull it out. Or if you're good enough, to, it's very small to pull it out with your fingertips, but, that, but you usually break it. Is one credit card better than another? <laughs> the golden Amex actually works very well. <laughs> or the, is it the black one these days? I'm not sure. I don't know. So the bee venom um, is actually a complex mixture of several components. And the way to describe it is it's actually an acid and a base that are contained in separate uh, bags, and then when it's ready to sting, they combine it. And an acid and a base are reactive. And that's exactly what it does. And it, um, it breaks down the cells and the skin where it's uh, stung. Uh, I personally, and I should be knocking on wood, um, have gotten to the point where I don't react to it anymore. And keeping bees, that's an awfully good thing. Yeah. And of course, I was very proud of it and <coughs> went and worked with the bees and it stung me right here. Oh, no. And uh, when I got in, my wife said, so, you don't react, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I had a talk the next day. So, yeah. But, uh, so a single sting contains 50 micrograms of venom and can be quite painful. So if you do get stung, cry like a baby. <laughs> Remove the stinger as quickly as possible, and that's the most important part. Then you can do the cooling with ice, you can put vegetables and fruits on it, <coughs> toothpaste, and all of these things are sort of bases or whatever that give a chemical counter reaction to what you've got in there. So the pollen basket, is like our shopping cart. So as a bee goes to the various flowers, uh, it collects the pollen and it packs it on the rear leg. And you can see here, this bee is pretty packed. And I'll, there's, I'll have a close-up of it. 
but it's an area on the back leg that is slightly um, convex, uh, sorry, concave, and has hairs on it. And so it takes the middle leg, puts the pollen in the middle leg, and then packs it in, just like you would into a brush if you were trying to pack hair or card wool. So here it is up close. And you can see all the little pollen grains um, and the comb that it's put against. And that's what it then flies back to the hybrid. And if you've ever had the opportunity to stand at a hive and watch, you can actually see them come in loaded and see that rear leg, with those rear legs filled with pollen at the right time of the season. Of course, it doesn't just collect uh, pollen, it also collects nectar. And the nectar um, is collected with its tongue, or proboscis. So this is what a honeybee's head looks like. Pretty complicated. Um, this is, these are the oscillus, or one oscillus, several oscilli, and the compound eye. Um, and you can see the tongue has hair on it so that it can slurp up the um, syrup. I think the bee queen always said, don't slurp your nectar. <laughs> So, a bee's tongue is like our own, it's soft and pointy, um, so that it can reach into, and, and most bees are sort of, you know, the flowers and the bees have a symbiotic relationship. There are three types of uh, bee, the short tongue, so the, the tongue is 0.5 to 3 millimeters, um, medium tongue and long tongue. The honey bee is at the low end of the long tongue. And these, this is a great picture because this shows all of the pollen uh, all over the bee. So not only does it slurp, but it's very, <laughs> it's messy. So there's a long tongued uh, bee. <coughs> and you can see the, uh, you can see the pollen basket. And as I said, bees and flowers have um, created this symbiotic relationship. So the orchid is a very long, deep flower. And you can see that the orchid bee, tropical bee, um, has a long viscous. And of course, like with every society, if you can't do it the right way, do it the illegal way. So this carpenter bee's tongue is too short to be able to get the nectar from that flower. And so what it does is it circumvents going in the front and just drills a hole in the side and takes the nectar. The flower loses out because the nectar's gone and it didn't get pollinated and the bee's happy. <laughs> so a bee's peepers, uh, as I said, compound and simple. Um, and uh, the thing that it, it cannot see red, a bee cannot see red, but it sees um, in a fairly broad range of color other than red, and it also sees in ultraviolet. Um, there's a, there's a, a laminated um, sheet up there that actually shows how different animals see, so when we're finished with the talk, please stop and just take a look at it. Um, and the bee also sees moving flowers better than it uh, sees stationary flowers. If you've ever gone to like Walmart <coughs> or a shopping center or furniture place where it has a wall full of TVs and they're all tuned to the same picture, mm -hmm. that's how a bee sees. Each individual lens or facet um, has an image and those images are then combined in the brain. So, this is what it sees like. And the top flower is what we would see, but because it sees in ultraviolet, it sees the flower like that. And if you've ever taken the time to look at a flower in a garden, you see where how all the colors sort of center into the middle part where the pollen is and the nectar is, that's because it's like a 
landing strip guideline for the bee to come in and get right to where it needs to go. How many of you have heard about a hairy eyeball? <laughs> well, here it is. The bee actually has hair on its eye to keep it clean and be able to wipe off any pollen as it goes in. Um, the other thing it uses uh, the hair as well is when it flies so that it can tell how fast it's going. And so here are the oscilli. The oscilli are actually um, photoreceptors. They only see in black and white, or dark and light, um, and are not, um, they don't detect any images. So the main reason for the oscilli is simply it's on the top of the head, and if you go to swat it, uh, it sees that shadow coming and then reacts to it. So you can see here, you can see the oscilli here, and here it's much closer. This bee is coming out of a cell, and you can see the three of them there. So that's why flies, most, most insects that have compound eyes have oscilli. So if you wonder why you've never been able to catch a fly, there you go. This lecture is about a lot more than just bees. <laughs> So the eyes do not rotate, um, they're fixed. You can see them right up there. This is not a honeybee, this is a, um, a, a potter, a mason bee. And so the other thing that they assume is that this, um, these eyes, these oscilli, orient towards the sun. And so it tells it what angle it flies at. And that's important, we'll touch on it why it's important. So the bee has two stomachs. One is a storage tank for the nectar that it, uh, it collects. And when it, puts, uh, when it puts the nectar in there, it combines with uh, enzymes. It's usually in there for half an hour to an hour, and those enzymes are already working with that, uh, with that nectar. So here it is. You've got the honey stomach where the nectar goes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you've got the normal stomach where, um, for its food. Complicated for such a little thing, huh? <laughs> so the, the bee uh, also makes wax. And uh, it makes wax through wax glands. That, uh, the reason it makes uh, wax is because um, it wants to, it creates its uh, cells, and also to cap the honey once it's been, or the nectar once the moisture's been taken out, and it becomes honey. So on the bottom left, you can see the white caps, and those are where the egg uh, and the larva are, where the pupa is then transforming. And this, you can see, this is a type of hive, it's not like my hive, this is a more natural hanging hive, and the shape that I was saying, it looks like a, a big U. Up at the top, you can see the arrangement um, of the cells, they're hexagonal because, and, and I have a chart here that uh, compares it, if you're doing circles or squares, the hexagonal is actually the best way for it to collect, uh, for space utilization. And both the uh, wasp and the honeybee use the hex uh, shape. So the bee actually constructs or creates the wax uh, in its body. And you have each one of these, you can see our uh, flakes of wax. There are six. And uh, um, below it is a flat area called a mirror that the liquid wax comes pushing out on and then it solidifies and becomes a flake. And then the bee can actually take the flake away, or another bee can take it, and then they construct or repair or whatever they need the wax for. In this case here, these are thicker flakes where they didn't get to put it anywhere, and so a second flake came out and doubled up its size. <coughs> um, and the wax was also uh, used to uh, 
retain so that it doesn't lose moisture in the body. Um, and the interesting thing is one and one quarter ounce of wax uh, to build the comb will hold four pounds of honey. So you can see I've got some uh, comb there in a, in a petri dish. If you hold it up against the light, you can see how clear it is. And uh, later on, I've got, uh, I'll touch on it again, but the thickness of one of those cell walls is two thousandths of an inch. Your hair thickness, in average, is three thousandths. So it's thinner than your hair. So the hive social structure. <laughs> yes. The queen. Yes. So this is, I do this lecture for kids too, and then I bring a whole box of like a crown and you go see. But uh, everybody wants to be the queen, of course. But you don't really want to be the queen. She's the most important individual in the hive. Uh, she's the only sexually mature uh, female. And she gives direction um, through pheromones and chemical communication. So, and uh, these are some of the characteristics that she has. She has a five year lifespan, but only two to three years of that is productive. She doesn't need wings to fly because she doesn't fly out unless the hive burns or something. So the wings are short, but she lays a lot of eggs. She lays, in her lifespan, she usually lays a million and a half uh, eggs. Um, so she needs, she has a large uh, abdomen. She has no pollen basket because she'll never have to collect any pollen. She does have a stinger that's curved and doesn't have any of the barbs that you saw on the picture because she, there's only one queen per hive. Guess what happens to the others? She uses the stinger and she'll go, so let's say for example, um, we'll touch on this a little later on as well, but if there are multiple queen cells and they're all maturing at the same time, first one out kills all the rest. It's a vicious hive. So here you see all the, all the attendants around the queen. You can see the short wings, the large abdomen. And there she is right there. In the, it's kind of hard to see. So when you open up a hive, um, it's usually, um, it looks like a chaotic place, but, there, but it isn't. Everybody's got duties and everybody's doing things. And what the queen is doing here is, uh, this is a very healthy hive. Because if you look at the eggs, or the, the covered cells, they're all very tight. There are very few empty ones in between, and you want to have that because around here, they're going to be putting the pollen and the bee bread and stuff to feed so that the workers can feed uh, those cells. And then the other thing too is, if you've got a cap, uh, if you've got an egg here, and an egg here, and an egg here, and here, those bees that have the wax to cover the, the cells, have to walk around too much. So it's nice when it's nice and tight. <clears throat> in a lot of the modern hives, the queen is marked so that you can see it more easily. Um, but that is intrusive again, so it all depends on how you want to keep your bees. And genetics matter because uh, the bee actually uses bee perfume to give the hive identity to give everybody a, a sense of well-being and let everybody know that the queen's all right. And also so that if they fly off, any stranger wanting to come in and doesn't have that perfume, they're gone. What would you mark them with? Uh, they have a little uh, a paint dot, like a nail polish. It's not nail polish, but it's that type of just a little color dot. Drone congregation areas. So in mating, the queen, so let's say a hive, and again, we'll touch on that, but a hive creates a queen. The queen is a virgin queen and needs to uh, be mated. She'll fly out, usually in the afternoon, about 20 feet off the ground, and she'll be flying along, and she'll fly through one of these DCAs, which are drone congregation areas. 
And as she flies through, 15 drones will go, oh, it's a queen, oh, look at this, let's go dance. And so they'll go after the uh, queen, they form comets, with what are called comets, and these drones are pretty stupid because they'll fly at anything that goes through there. <laughs> but uh, once, once a bee, a drone, has uh, mated with the queen, it breaks off the private parts and dies. So, it's welcome to stay in the DCA, right? But uh, I, I came across a really neat thing. It said, um, at the DCA, they spend hours each day playing poker, and shouting, shooting pool, and they're talking about how their women are always nagging them to take out the garbage, or the bee equivalent. As they wait for a queen to fly by, yes, they have it tough, those drones. <laughs> so drones are stingless, and uh, of course, when I bring the, my basket in and I ask them if they want to be a queen or a drone or a worker, <coughs> only one queen, so they don't want to be a queen, they can't be a queen, but they'll be drones because they don't have to do any work. Drones do not add to the hive. They do no work. They're the males. Um, they do no work. Do they uh, do dishes? No, they read comic books, drink beer. Um, yeah, they don't do dishes. And so, so all the all the kids and, and all the boys say, oh yeah, oh, I want to be a drone, right? <laughs> and right after that, I tell them, well, come September, the women kick you out because you don't do anything and they don't have enough food to hold you over the winter, so you die. <laughs> so it all evens up. Yes, sir. Do the drones have a different genetic profile? They're all coming from the queen. Will seven drones have seven profiles? Um, I don't know the exact answer to that, but the queen, and I'm glad you asked that, because the queen will actually fly off uh, some distance so that there is an inbreeding. So any of the drones that congregate are congregating in like the hive, and she sneaks out to go down to the corner. Um, so yeah, so that's how they minimize the, the inbreeding, and the drones that all hang out at the same DCA are most probably the same profile, because that's one hive. That would be one hive. So before the drones leave, what's the percentage of drones to workers in the hive? Oh, that's a good question. Next. No. <laughs> um, the I don't know the exact percentage, but it all depends on how active, how warm, and how much food, and how, how healthy the hive is. If, and I was going to get to this, if, for example, the queen, the queen has to mate within 20 days. If it doesn't mate within 20 days, then it lays eggs that become drones. And those drones are... Um, unfertilized females, fertilized males. And basically, then you end up with a hive that's all drones and, and you don't get anything. Um, it's a very small percentage, but obviously if you have 80,000, it's probably, I don't know, I've never stood and counted, but three, four, five thousand maybe? Yeah, so a small percentage. A small percentage. Yes, sir? Will, there, will they only mate with one drone, or do they have multiple uh, consorts? Multiple drones. 15 to 20. I've never witnessed it, but apparently you can witness it, and it's usually 15 to 20 drones uh, that will mate with the queen. For a million eggs, you better have a lot of boyfriends. Yeah. <laughs> Any other? Yes, sir. Where do the drones hang out in the climate weather? <laughs> uh, they don't the leave. Well, that's a good question because um, in inclement weather, everybody stays home. And so even the queen doesn't fly. And that's why if they don't mate within that 20, let's say we had 20 days of rainy, lousy weather, the queen doesn't mate uh, and even do the drones. So the drones are in the hive and they're not in the comet. Right. So during, so they're, it, they truly live together in the hive with the females, uh, with the worker bees, but they go play pool at night. And then they come back at night, right? And they eat far more than they're supposed to. And they really are um, a bad example, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, but as I said, they, they don't live through the winter. So, and the only, the only reason for a drone is to mate with the queen. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, 
Any other question? So here's the queen, and if you follow the little arrows up at the uh, top, um, you can see the little eggs at the bottom of a, uh, of a cell. These cells are plastic. You can actually get foundation cells that are plastic these days. I personally don't like using them because I, I just don't like using plastic. But um, you can see they're all nicely shaped. It's exactly the same thing in a, um, in a natural hive. And this is what the egg down here on the bottom right hand, that's what a bee's egg looks like, a queen's egg looks like. The queen is up uh, right there laying an egg into one of the cells and the attendant bees are all there ready to care for it. So there's the larva uh, and then it pupates and becomes an adult bee. I have a chart right here for under the um, a wasp nest that shows what the various time frames are. And usually a bee, a worker bee, will live for one season. And uh, by the end of the season, uh, will die with ragged wings because it's just been worked that hard. But we'll see, we'll, we'll go through that. So the egg uh, pupates, you can see the egg down below, and then it uh, grows into a pupa, an adult, and then when it's ready, it chews through the cap and emerges. And the one thing that is a lot of people don't know is that bees actually create silk. And that silk is much stronger than spider silk, and they put it on the inside of the cells to strengthen them. And that silk is actually gathered <coughs> and is used to make bulletproof vests. So you now know a fact that nobody else knows and you can use it. <laughs> so a hive has 60% silk in the larval chambers. And that's also another reason why the wax from the larval chambers isn't used in spinning it out. So here are the life stages, uh, 43 days and more. And we'll, we'll go into this in a little more detail as the bee goes through its life. So the one thing to remember, so we have the queen bee, we've got the worker bees and the drones, and the worker bees are 100% female, and they undertake all kinds of jobs as they are born. And we'll go through some of these now. So there's the drone. You can see how big it is, big and fat. No stinger. So I'm sure everybody's at least seen one picture of somebody covered with bees. And that's usually a drone. Uh, that's usually somebody's collected drones, put some queen pheromone on, on their nose, and all the drones go, whoa! <laughs> Fool you. <laughs> and they don't have any stingers, so they're harmless. So the workers comprise the majority of the bees. And as I said, anywhere from 20,000, you start a hive with about 1,000 in a nuke. Um, and you can build it up to 80,000 uh, bees. I've got uh, six, um, six hives with an average of probably about 40 to 70,000 bees in each hive. Wow. So, a lot of bees. Excuse me. Yes. When Sorry. you say you have a hive with 40,000 bees, how big is that? Um, it's probably two and a half by two and a half by five feet, by six feet. And uh, last year, six, a six-foot hive uh, gave me, well, in total, I got uh, 450 pounds of honey out of this. So, yes, did someone have a question? No? All right, so the first one uh, is cleaners. Um, a bee that is one to two days old becomes a cleaner. And what they've got to do is clean out the larval cell um, they also, um, they've, got to, they've got to clean out um, any larval residue as well as the, uh, any food scraps or whatever was left out. And the queen will actually go and uh, inspect it, and if it doesn't pass muster, they've got to go back and clean it again. <laughs> yeah, she's got the royal prerogative. 
So then after the cleaners, a couple of days after that, they become undertakers. They do not have horses. <laughs> um, and what they do is they, uh, they're responsible for removing dead bees and also any diseased or dead broods that might threaten the colony's well-being. So then we have a bunch of nurses. So this is uh, after the undertaker role. Uh, the nurses take care of the developing larva. And it's said that they will check a single larva over a thousand times a day. So they're pretty fastidious in what they're doing. They will feed pure oil jelly, which is a milky concentrate. You'll see, uh, you'll see a picture of it in a minute. Uh, secreted from food glands in their head to the larva that's going to be destined to be a queen. And uh, for those that are destined to be um, workers, they don't get the oil jelly, they get the bee bread. And the bee bread is simply a mixture of pollen and honey and royal jelly, a little bit of it. But uh, there's, there are important reasons why they feed them, and I'll, I'll give you that in a minute in terms of size. So, and if the hive is infected, then the bee, the nurse bees, will actually select specific honeys that they can feed to the workers or the infected bees that have certain uh, antibiotic uh, properties. So they can, actually, they can actually choose how they do that. And uh, that was a study that was done at the Martin Luther University in Halle Wittenberg in Germany and was uh, brought um, on BBC Earth in October of 2014. So then we have the builders, and those are the bees that have the wax glands. And uh, they're approximately 12 days old when they become builders and they secrete the wax flakes to construct and repair comb. Um, they will also cap the comb of ripened honey and developing pupae. The amazing thing is, for one pound of wax, a bee has to eat seven pounds of honey. So if you create a new hive and you've got new frames that have no combs, you're not going to get a lot of honey that first year because the bees are consuming it to build the wax. So that's why you regenerate uh, the wax comb once you've uh, spun it out. Uh, then we have air conditioning and heating. Um, so when they, um, they, they have to take the water out of the nectar and bring it down to 10%, and they do that by fanning it. So the temperature controllers stand over the nectar that's brought in and take the moisture out of it. They also ventilate the, the, the hive when it's hot. So in, when I had my hives and we had that hot weather last summer, I do crack the top, but they, you'll see a whole bunch of bees out front fanning the air and bringing it through to try and cool it down. In winter time, they'll all cluster around and move their muscles, and in moving their muscles, they expend the heat, and that heat is what keeps, um, keeps that cluster hot. And the queen is in the middle of that cluster. Oops. So there you can see on the left-hand side, a honeybees on the entrance to a hive, and this is a solitary bee. I'm sure everybody's seen one of these. It, it's big and forms a roll, and that's a solitary bee. So and there's the there's the little hole that it digs in the sand for its egg. And there's no colony with that. Then it becomes then they become guards. So guards are the la guard bees are the last task uh, that bees in the hive are before they become field bees. And these guards stand at. If you've ever had an opportunity to stand at a hive, you'll see the guard bees standing there. If anybody lands, they'll come out to check, and they ask for, uh, they, they smell them to see if they're of the right odor. Um, and uh, also if it's, you know, if it's an intruder, like an earwig or, or a grasshopper or a wasp or anything, they'll actually fight it off. Um, and they only let hive members uh, enter with any society, sometimes they can be bribed <laughs> with nectar. 
<laughs> um, then the other thing they do too is they go and check if the hive has any cracks or anything so that um, they call the construction guys over to seal it off so that robber bees can't come in and stuff. And uh, they also emit an alarm pheromone that if they sting, it notes, it uh, lets everybody else know there's an attack underway and so then they, they all come out and help out. So it's not just the guy bees, but the worker bees that will also come and rise to security. So here's, here are guard bees. There's the guard bee standing at the entrance, very alert, and down here they're saying, uh, you want the better end of me, buddy? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so they, they're ready with the stingers. And so when, after the guard bee, they become foraging bees, the field bee, and that happens at approximately 14 days old, bees leave the nest, at sunrise and visit flowers in a four to five kilometer radius up to three miles um, from, the, from the hive in search of nectar, pollen, propolis, or propolis, and water. Um, they drink, they also use the water for cooling, just like an evaporative cooler that we use here. Um, they make approximately anywhere from 10 to 20 trips, depending on how far they have to fly per day, um, with each trip lasting anywhere from half an hour to an hour. And that's why they have the baskets where they put, and the stomach where they, as they gather stuff up, they put it out. And then uh, at night they go back to the hive and stay with the, in the hive just as the drones do. At the age of six to eight weeks, uh, they will usually die in the field uh, because they've just been totally spent. A bee is just always looking for uh, stuff for the hive, for the better of the society. And in winter, uh, uh, bees don't fly, um, but they do, they are alive, and they do eat, and the cluster moves around uh, on the, um, where the honey is and eats the, uh, eats the honey as a cluster. So. My hives right now, although they're totally covered in snow, uh, if I put my ear to it, I can hear it buzz. Yes? Just a question about timing. So I, I, I think I have the wrong picture in my head. This is after two days, this is after four days, this is after 14 days. Is that like a whole bunch of bees all at once go through that together? Or is every day a new, are new bees born every day? Yep, yes. So it's a continuous flow all yeah. season. Yeah. And uh, depending on the weather and depending on the food sources, the queen bee uh, might increase or decrease. So if you have a very hot summer and you have the hives in the proper location, in other words, facing east in a sheltered spot, um, you have much more uh, opportunity to have more bees being born than if they were north facing and in a wind swept field. <laughs> Uh, with very little food. But you can keep bees anywhere. People have kept bees in the city. Uh, you know, in a loft in their apartment or on the top of their building, the apartment buildings. Question? Uh, yep, sorry. The guidance system. When the hive moves, the bees seem to know where the hive moved to. Can you speak to that guidance system? Yeah, every hive comes with a little pen and paper, so you need a forward <laughs> address. <laughs> yeah, that's um, no, that, that is true, but what happens is you, if you move the hive in the middle of the day, you're going to lose your bees. What you have to do is you have to move the hive either very late at night, when all the bees are back in it, or very early in the morning before they leave. And what a bee does is it will come out, it will fly around, orient itself, and then fly up, and it will come back to the same spot. So even if you move the hive two feet away, it will be lost. Because it goes back to that spot. And so, and so when, you, when you create a new, like for example, I get, and we'll talk about it, but when you get a queen cell, I can actually create new hives without having a, a queen. If you buy a queen, it's 125 bucks. Mm -hmm. So it becomes expensive. But if you rear your own queens, 
then you can take them and take them outside of that five mile or three mile radius and the queen will be brand new with new bees coming to it, then you bring it back and then it'll be oriented to that hive. But you have to do it at night when they're in the hive. If you move the, and I've done this, if I move the hive during the day, you know, I thought, oh, like eight o'clock, they're all in there. Well, it was, I, I lost half the hive because of it, so, yes sir. So when the queen initiates a swarm, does she do it early in the day or does she follow those same rules so that it keeps everybody together to find the hive? I'm, I, Good question. no, <laughs> but I'm not quite sure. I'm, what I think happens there is, yeah. so depending, so a swarm occurs when a bee is overgrown, you know, the space is overgrown or overpopulated. And so I'm sure that what happens is there's a lot of communication going on. Okay, we're ready, right? Right? Are you up? Are we all? Are you with? Okay, let's. So they all gather and those guys then head out. And I've had swarms that I've collected in the morning, I've had swarms that I've collected in the afternoon. So, you know, did they fly a long way? Do they only. I'm not quite sure. But I don't. Th I think they communicate with each other and head out. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You're saying swarm. It's because another queen has hatched. Right. And there's an enormous amount of bees. Is it the new queen that right. it splits? No, it's the old queen that has. The old out. queen. Yeah. You're not doing your job anymore, kid. <laughs> <laughs> and she gathers up the old workers and off they go. The old folks on. Yeah, the old folks on. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, so, and the other thing that's really interesting is in the springtime, or now, right? actually throughout the winter, they're in this dark hive, right? And they really don't know, is it cold, is it warm, is, it, is the weather right? So they all sit around and they hold straws. And the, the bee with the short straw has to head out to check. And of course, a bee is a cold-blooded insect, right? And if it's cold, five, very cold, Within three feet of a hive, the muscles freeze up. So if the if the scout bee that pulled the short straw doesn't come back, everybody else stays in. <laughs> but if the bee comes back and has directions to the red maple buds being ready, then they all fly up. So. <clears throat> it lays approximately fifteen hundred eggs a day. A million plus in a lifetime. Oh, God, I'm tired. <laughs> so in answer to the question, there are three reasons for a new queen. If for some reason the queen dies, uh, they create an emergency situation. They will take a, um, a cell and select a uh, larval uh, worker, put it in there, and start feeding royal jelly to it, which then creates the queen. Supersedure means that a queen is not doing its job, it's lousy laying eggs, and it just isn't getting the hive uh, population up, so they all say, hey, winter's coming, we need to have people gathering stuff, so you're out. And so they will actually create a cell on the outside of the comb that hangs down, and you can see it's bigger than, than these cells, and uh, they will start feeding it royal jelly, and of these, they actually make more than one. So that's where the, the firstborn queen goes and kills all the others. And this here is a swarming cell, uh, a swarming where um, the queen, um, because the, the queen is old or, uh, not, I'm sorry, not because it's old, because, this, because the place is overcrowded, it's done too good of a job, they create another hive, basically, and then they divide in half. Off they go. Um, balling the reigning queen means that this queen that obviously wasn't working, uh, what they did was they all get around her and get really hot and then basically cook her. I'm sorry to share this nasty stuff. <laughs> Nature's cruel. <laughs> um, and so the bee uh, doesn't have a cell phone. Um, but what it does is it communicates through dance. And uh, I have two charts here behind me that tell you if it does a round circle, 
uh, the food is within 35 yards of the hive. If it does two loops like this with a central axis, the central axis actually, in relation to the sun, tells them in what direction. And then, uh, so the axis of the loops is the direction of the food source, and then it'll wiggle, um, and the amount of wiggles will tell it how far. So it's over 35 yards, and can be up to five, uh, five miles away, or sorry, five kilometers, three miles away. So, uh, and you can see some of, the, uh, some of the examples of that. And so they actually take the sun and the angle to it, and that's where the oscillators then come into, into play. Where do they do the dance? They do the dance uh, on the inside of the combs or on the, on the uh, landing strip. And they'll have here, it just shows a single bee, but what they'll have is they'll have a whole bunch of bees around it going, where'd you find it? Was it good? Yeah, McDonald's, really? Let's go. <laughs> and so they're, they've got a whole group that's around them. And that's what's really uh, quite interesting when you keep bees, you see all these things happening and understanding it, you can observe it, it's really great. So as William Blake said, there is no time for sorrow with a busy bee. Our history with bees goes back to almost 10,000 BC. There were cave drawings um, in Valencia, Spain that show, and take a look at that, that drawing because you'll see, I have another picture later on where uh, you can actually see modern day collection. It always was thought that uh, bees had spontaneous uh, reproduction because of the swarming and because of the large numbers within the hive. But we now know that's not true. And bees throughout the ages have been part of our folklore, part of our drawing, our artistry, in myths, all kinds of cultural stories, and play very important uh, parts in those, in those cultural icons and things. And here's that, you remember the picture two slides back? So here's some modern uh, indigenous people gathering honey uh, off cliff faces and whatnot. And this is actually a comb. So these combs hang there, and he's got a basket, and he drips out the honey. He's on this little teeny tiny ladder. Wow. So anyway, it's still happening. He has a high tolerance for pain, I assume. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've never asked him, actually, but I assume. So 8,000 years ago, uh, for sure, uh, because there was uh, wax residue found in pots that were undug. And my connection uh, to beeswax was um, when you read the in introduction, I actually ran an investment casting foundry for um, 30 years in St. Albans. Investment casting uh, used beeswax years, the Chinese used beeswax to make uh, jewelry. And um, dentists uh, used beeswax, instead of carving teeth out of wood, they used wax to make an impression and then would cast a mold for bridges and whatnot, dental uh, paraphernalia. And from that, in World War II, at the need, because of the need of high quantities of precision metal parts, uh, it became an industry. And that's what I made. I made um, investment castings for farming missiles. Uh, there are eight uh, units of um, components on the moon from our company, on each lunar lander. So it was an exciting, interesting industry, and it all stemmed back from bees and the Chinese. So they've been very important to humans. They pollinate uh, one-sixth of all the flowering plants and approximately 400 agricultural plants. The agricultural crops in 2010 were $19 billion, uh, of which one-third, uh, of which that represents one-third of everything we eat. Uh, in 2013, the honey crop 
uh, whether it was liquid honey or honeycomb or mixed with mead or whatever else, um, valued at 317 million, point one, sorry, uh, million dollars. So that's quite substantial. What is mead? Mead is uh, lousy wine with good honey. Okay. <laughs> Anybody make mead here? <coughs> I should ask you. My son does. Okay, and what is mead? Um, I asked him and I didn't really get it. Okay. Don't go and ask him what I just told you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, back to the pollination. You said that honeybees are European immigrants? Oops. Yes. So, previous to honeybee immigration, it was it solitary bees that pollinated? or? Yes. So, um, this might not be politically correct, but who cares, right? Honeybees represent 20% and what native bees 80% of the pollinating mass. The reason honeybees get so much publicity 317.1 million dollars, right? And so to keep that in perspective, they go, ah, ah we, we've got problems. But they don't talk about all the solitary bees they're killing. And so we'll get into that a little more, but keep that in mind. The honeybee is only a fifth of the whole um, question. And these people that move bees around because it's a money-making proposition. Well, but they, they have to move them now because there's so much colony collapse, right? You have to bring in new pollinators sometimes from... Well, that's the what they the say, West. but in actuality, if you were to um, support and, and um, you know, encourage the native bees, then you wouldn't need the, the large things. But then, it's, it's like anything else, and, and I'm getting into some deep weeds here because it's, you know, the politics and everything else of it. But when you have monocultures like corn or whatever else, almonds, it's like anything else. It, it's a huge drain on the resources where nature never meant it to be like that. And so when you then, so to address the problem, they don't address the problem of breaking it up. They address the problem by bringing in truckloads of bees that have probably traveled for a heck of a long time, been cooped up. And how do you feel after being in a car for 24 hours and not, you know? So they keep creating the problems, in my opinion. Um, so here are some of the foods and vegetables that we would not have if we did not have pollination. And yes, I've got the honeybee up there but uh, it, it also, um, the wild, the, the indigenous bee is also very much a part of it. And in Africa, Kenya for example, they're actually using <coughs> bees as an invisible fence where they've got the crop uh, field, they're growing some sort of corn there, and on the outside they've got all these hives and what that, those hives do is um, uh, keep the elephants out. Isn't it? Yeah. Innovative. So, so um, the bee is a, as I said, an herbivore. It creates, plant, it creates products from plants, the honey, the bee pollen, the propolis, and then it creates animal from itself, it creates the royal jelly uh, from glands, the beeswax from glands, and the bee venom. And all of those are actually used. So the honey is yum, good for, and, and I, if someone didn't hear, I do have uh, honey samples, so before you leave, you can get a lick of honey. I hope I don't run out of uh, stir sticks. But uh, honey, raw honey, not the, not the um, honey that is processed, but raw honey is very, very good for you because it has all of the minerals and all of the things that um, the bee has eaten and is very good also if you eat local honey. I've actually had people that bought my honey and have eaten it and gotten rid of uh, um, allergy medicine. 
So if you get local honey and eat it, and they were only doing a teaspoon a day uh, in, in coffee or, in, or in, in tea or whatever, or just pure, uh, they got rid of their allergy medicines. So um, honey won't spoil. It's the only food that will last forever without refrigeration. They've actually opened up uh, tombs from the pharaohs and uh, had honey that was unspoiled. So um, <clears throat> it's, don't, don't throw that honey in the fridge out because it's been there for five weeks or whatever. It's usually raw honey will crystallize. My honey is crystallized because it is raw, forms crystals, but it just becomes creamy. If you want it to become liquid, all you do is you put it back into warm water, and then it becomes liquid. So, um, it's enriched with enzymes and uh, has a chemical composition that's very stable and uh, is controlled for pH. Um, so it's placed into honeycombs and moisture controlled, and then it's sealed when the moisture is 10% from the nectar and brought down to 10%. Sir, the interest. Um, I'm sorry, yes. Are, are traveling a couple miles, kilometers away. Is that more how the hive is managed? Yes. The smoke. And yeah. So that you don't um, you don't use chemical. Like for example, we'll talk about uh, mites later on. But one of the ways to control mites is you can get a mite strip from uh, <clears throat> a bee house, like a bee supply house, that's uh, terrible poison, mm -hmm. and you put that on after you've gathered the honey, or you can do it organically by putting in rhubarb leaves. And they'll eat the rhubarb leaves, and the rhubarb leaves have the same com composition as the chemical. So, for anybody, does anybody keep bees here? Ah, you should have told me that before, so I, I'd know. <laughs> but uh, I, for those of you that keep bees, I, for two years now, what I've done, is at the beginning of the season when the rhubarb leaves are fresh, I put rhubarb leaves in and they'll eat them and it controls the mites. And so mites are, and we'll see it, mites are getting to their tracheal tubes and that part of why they sort of leave. Um, oh, and the other thing about honey is if you go for a hike or a camping trip, take along some honey, if you get a cut, or get a bruise, you can put honey on it, it's antiseptic, and it will heal. So, and never heat honey, because never heat raw honey, because then you do destroy its curative uh, properties. The picture on the left top corner is a picture of pollen. So there you go, why do you sneeze when you have pollen? And it looks pretty nasty. And there's a bee with a pollen basket that's full, and it's covered with pollen. I, uh, there are some pictures there, too, of bees that are, they have hair all over their body for exactly that reason, that the pollen um, <coughs> sticks to it. Um, the pollen, uh, nurse bees uh, feed it uh, for nutrition, uh, or eat it for nutrition, and then squeeze <coughs> the royal jelly, which is the <coughs> larva to the queen. And after three days, royal jelly is mixed with bee bread, uh, which is a mixture of pollen and enzymes and honey. Um, a hive gathers approximately 100 pounds of pollen per year. So that's a lot of flowers. Uh, it provides a wide range of nutrients from proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals. And uh, usually bees will forage one flower so that it can um, cross-pollinate. Uh, it will also collect pollen from plants that provide no nectar, such as corn. Uh, and it's thought that uh, <coughs> pesticide-contaminated corn is thought to be one of the problems with bee colonies. So. Mm -hmm. Propolis. Propolis comes from the Greek word defense of the city. And it is, for anybody that keeps bees, you've had to fight propolis and undo the tops and whatnot. It is a heck of a strong glue. Uh, it comes from tree buds and bark, and bees tend to put it anywhere where there are cracks or things to be held down, like tops or frames. Uh, but they, and it's got an antiseptic quality to it, 
It's a natural antiseptic, and, and it kills fungus and bacteria. And they will uh, line uh, brood cells with it so that there is a, a natural um, bacterial avoidance. And then also, you can see here, um, up at the top, um, there's a mouse. Obviously, a mouse is too big for a bee to carry out. So what they do is they encapsulate it in propolis. And that way, it isolates and keeps it from contaminating the hive. Same thing with an earwig down here. Um, and so therefore, they mummify, mummify the, uh, the carcasses. Propolis has been found uh, effective against a lot of bacteria, staph and strep, bed sores, diabetic, oyst ulcers, surgical wounds, common cold, and uh, skin uh, disorders. So if you go to your local uh, homeopathic store, you'll find propolis. You'll also find royal jelly and pollen. Here's the royal jelly, and you can see the picture over at the end where there's a uh, larva. That's actually a queen cell that they've cut open, and that larva is, uh, or pupa is, uh, eating royal jelly and will, should become a queen. The royal jelly is a powerful energetic. Um, it's the only food that's fed to queens who then grow two and a half times larger than the other bees. So if you eat royal jelly, you're off the diet. So the queen gains 3,000 times her weight after five or six days on royal jelly. <laughs> There's a lot of jokes could be made with that. Uh, but it allows the queen to lay eggs that exceed her own body weight. And I mean, figure it out, a million eggs, right? So it needs something. And it's fed to worker bee larva for three days um, to get their weight gain up by 1,500 times, um, which, at, which it is at the end of the third day. It supposedly improves transmission of nerve impulses, increases the efficiency of the brain, and it's thought to help with treating infertility. I'm not quite sure if that last one is how they market it in homeopathic stores. But. How do they collect it? Very carefully. <laughs> um, you actually... All of this stuff is very expensive because of the small quantities, but they'll open up queen cells, they'll force queen cells, and then the bees put royal jelly in it, and then they take it away. So, this is interesting. Guards against flu and influenza, and has all of these other benefits as well. So. It's, I'm sorry? There's a TV commercial that seems to have that same rural picture. Oh, probably. She's got a definite food look, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah, we all use it. So then beeswax, which is the other product uh, that comes from the animal, has a lot of excellent qualities. Its chemical makeup is very stable. It's virtually unaffected by time. Um, and pieces that have been removed from the tomb after thousands of years is still pliable and usable. It's insoluble in water, so it's highly valued for its waterproofing uh, qualities. It's recovered from shipwrecks in perfect con condition and still usable, so underwater. It's valued as a polish so that you waterproof the wood. And during World War II, hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, were used to waterproof equipment such as tents, ammunition, and ignition systems. Uh, it has a very, it has the highest melting point of any of the natural waxes described between 145 and 50 degrees, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's an excellent fuel, and for centuries it was the only wax that was available. It's highly valued for candle making because it burns clean and has no smoke smudge, and the flame is uniquely bright and white and small, so compact. And it doesn't uh, produce any unpleasant odor in burning. In ancient times, it was also used as a skin softener and as a remedy against dysentery. And the thing that was really interesting to me was many people used it as a tax. So in Rome, when they defeated the Corsicans, they imposed a tax on them 
of 100,000 pounds of beeswax. And in the 1300s, French farmers paid an annual tax of two pounds of beeswax to the king. Where do you think that um, nunning your beeswax comes from? Oh, that's it. I don't know, but that's, yeah. Um, there's a radio show. I don't know if anybody knows it, um, but you can write into them or call them, and they'll tell you what the origin is. If you need me your email address, I'll give you the email. Okay. Um, so in ancient times, the production of wax was much more important than the honey. And uh, the wax comb um, is at an angle of 13 degrees, so that the wax, so that the nectar doesn't roll out or uh, grain. And as I said, it's hexagonal, um, and that's uh, so that it, it's more space safe. And that's, uh, that's not skill, that is uh, inbred in the bee to do that. It can hold 22 times its own weight, and as I said before, the, the thickness is between two and three thousandths of an inch. <coughs> and uh, we as humans have copied that design in many in the geodesic dome constructions, and also in the 747 uh, airliner, the Boeing airliner. So here are some of the things that beeswax is actually used for. Cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, polishes, crayons, the grinding and polishing of optical lenses such as the lens that went up into space with Hubbard um, was used with beeswax. Candies and chewing gums. So if you look at this list, all of you at some point had something to do with beeswax. That's all? That's the only reaction? <laughs> ah! <laughs> so, uh, I've been stung many times, and um, I'm not quite sure if it's helped, you know, with my joint pain or whatever, um, but there are uh, people in the far, um, in the mid, uh, not mid-east, in the Eastern European and Far East uh, countries and use bee stings for all kinds of uh, um, cures. And they have uh, several components that are anti-inflammatory, have anti-inflammatory product uh, properties, but I'm not sure whether it's that or the reaction to the immune system. And the part, if anybody hasn't recognized it, that's an eyeball. Yes, I know. Okay. And that's why I was waiting for a bigger reaction. But, what's that? Can't believe it's real. Yeah. So, the hairy eyeball. Uh, there's also been claims that uh, it would be the sting would address multiple sclerosis, shingles, burns, tendonitis, and infections. Why would the bee sting the eyeball if you weren't bothering the bee? Well, a lot of times, and you can see it here, that, um, you know, that might have been staged, but what they do is they actually take the bee and sting an area. So, for example, if you had uh, rheum rheumatism in your knee, you might get knee therapy by doing 10 bee stings around your knee. And uh, bee stings, other than if you're allergic, um, are not really deadly. Um, you can have a reaction, but out of uh, uh, all of the people in America, there were only 54 deaths from bee stings a couple of years ago. So myths and uh, misunderstandings. All bees live in hives. No. <laughs> only 10% of the world's 20,000 bee species are social and live in hives. And only a small percentage of these construct hives. In North America, only the European honeybee and the bumblebee build uh, hives and live in colonies. And most bees, approximately 75 to 80 percent, are solitary and live in individual nests tunneled into the soil. Misconception two, all bees make honey. No, only the honeybee makes enough honey to harvest. Honeybee colonies are perennial, and that's why they have to store up food to live through the winter. Bumblebees make small amounts of honey, but the colonies uh, only are annual, and so therefore, they don't need to store food. 
here are some of the native bees, and none of these uh, make honey at all. Native to what? Native to North America. Okay. <coughs> but they're pollinators. They're pollinators, correct. And what they do is they'll eat the pollen, they'll eat the nectar, but they don't store it, and they don't make honey. Bees die after they sting. Nope. <laughs> Only honeybees die after they're stinging. Native bees do not die. And without a colony to defend, a lot of times you can be right out there with them and they won't attack you because they have nothing to defend. Other than if you were to step on them or try and swap them. Misconception four is that bees are declining because of colony collapse disorder. And this is to the question that came before. Uh, this is true if they live in a, if they're honeybees and they live in a managed hive. But if they're wild bees and live in individual tunnels, uh, they are not affected by this. Uh, the cause of the disease is still unknown, although there are some thoughts that it's uh, neonicotinoids or other pesticides. I'll, I'll show you a slide in a minute but it could also be stress and malnutrition. And again, with uh, malnutrition being the single crop, uh, the monoculture crops. Misconception five, wasps or bees. Somebody asked me about a yellow jacket, there it is. So the difference is that a wasp has a very thin waist, the bee does not. And uh, some of the problems are that um, they are the same order, but they are not they are not bees. And uh, we have, uh, bees are vegetarian, as I said before, and wasps are carnivores. And a lot of times we have misleading names because we just see a flash of yellow, and oh yeah, that was a bee. Well, it might be a bee, might be a wasp, might be any kind of thing. The yellow jacket is also notorious for raiding picnics, and another name for it is a meat bee. So how the heck are you supposed to know if it's a bee or a wasp if it's called a meat bee? <laughs> Um, and wasps are especially aggressive if you stumble upon their nests because they are, they are definitely defending their, their uh, colonies. But wasps are important because they also control insect insects such as, uh, that are harmful to our crops, such as um, um, caterpillars or other larvae that eat pests. So the challenges for the bees, stress factors. And these are some of the things that really work on the bee. Climate and weather this year has been terrible. And I've had bees suffer from dysentery because they're cooped up. Um, and there's not much you can do about it other than hope that there's going to be warm weather soon. Right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> And then, of course, if you have residues in the bee products from, uh, uh, from pesticides or any other contaminant, that goes back through. So there's a lot of stuff that affects the bee. Varroa mite. There, so you know how small a the bee is. There's the varroa mite on top. And the varroa mite basically sits on the bee and sucks its what we call blood. What would, for us would be blood, but it's their life. life uh, Liquid. And it will also infect brood. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, it will suck life on brood and especially on drones. So, if you go in and look at your drone brood and count the mites, then you know whether you have an infestation or not. And then this is the tracheal mite. So, we had talked about um, the spiracles. And these are the tubes that go off the side of the bee, and you can see how small those are, relatively. And the problem is that it's just like us having a cold and then having a congested chest. We can't breathe, we <coughs> and uh, so what the bees try and do is they then go out and walk in front of the hive trying to get air. And it's thought that uh, an overabundance of tracheal mites might actually make them fly off as well because they're not sure what's happening. They can't breathe there, and then they head out. But that's unsubstantial. And this is the kind of thing that I treat with, uh, that I treat with, um, 
rhubarb leaves. These ones. These would be the ones that uh, that you would have at the end of the season we'll put the strip down. <clears throat> and then we have all kinds of things. So some of these are dead leaves and you actually, you actually have to uh, burn up your hive. So the uh, American fowl brood. Did I spell that one? Yeah. Fowl <laughs> brood. <laughs> um, but and then if infestations as a beekeeper you hate to open up and see wax moths like that um, they just ruin everything but if the hive is healthy um, then uh, the bees will take care of it I was sick uh, five years ago and couldn't take care of my hives and by leaving them unattended for the winter I had a whole bunch of wax moths that came in when I opened it up I couldn't even take because of the um, the wedding, I couldn't even take the frames out. And so I said, oh, I'm not going to bother with it now. I put it out behind the garage, and two weeks later I had a, I had a colony in there of bees. And six weeks later, it was thriving, and by the end of the year, it produced almost 150 pounds of honey. So, nature takes care of its own. <laughs> Bears, anybody? <laughs> so bears, if you live in a bear, in, a, in an area where a bear might be, then you need to protect your hive before the bear gets there. And the way to do that is put an electric fence around it, put strips of tin foil covered with honey, and turn up the temperature. So when the bear comes to lick it, he gets a shock on his tongue, and off he goes, he'll never come back. If you try and do that after he's wrecked the hive once, forget it. Because <laughs> no electric fence is going to stop it. He knows there's a source of food there, right? Um, skunks and raccoons put the hive up higher so that the coon or the skunk has to um, show its stomach and then the bees can sting. Everything else is too covered with hair and is protected. Uh, and I have a really funny, so I had, I had uh, beehives and I had a skunk. And I don't like killing things, so I live trapped it, put it in my car, put a blanket over it, took it off, way off in the distance. 22 of them that I did that to. Oh my On the 23rd time, I come out of my, my driveway, turn the corner, and there's this guy, he's got his trunk open and he's pulling up a blanket with a cage and I go, what are you doing? He says, oh, I've had a skunk problem. <laughs> really? And where do you live? <laughs> he lived where I was dropping him. <laughs> that bloody skunk goes, here we go again. <laughs> anyway. Uh, and for mice, um, you cover the entrance prior to fall, cold weather, because they'd go in and they'd go and find a nice warm uh, place. And again, the mice would stay because the bees are starting to ball up. So the mice know to wait until the bees are clustered and aren't going around all over the, the hive. And insects, um, if the hive is very healthy, they'll fight off a yellow jacket. Earwigs, earwigs will hide in corners, you just have to get rid of them. Ants put the hive in moats of, into buckets of water so the ants can't swim across. Um, and also look where you're locating them. If you locate them on a forest floor that's full of, you know, or a meadow that's full of ant hives uh, or ant hills, then you'll end up with ant problems. Severe weather is also, as I said, and you can see, so bees will, on a warm day, make a cleansing flight. And uh, you, if you go up to your hives, you can actually see the track of where they go out and then they fly back. Um, if it's so cold, big burn? They poop. Right, right. So those are the, those, I used a nice word, cleansing flight. Uh, so if, I, if I'm in fifth grade and say poop, they go, oh, 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 oh. But uh, anyway, so that's, uh, that's the cleansing poop flight that they do right here. And if they can't get out, um, dysentery is the next thing. 
And you can see down below, there's lots of, um, because they're covered up, the uh, circulation in the hive is bad, and then they also can't get, you know, then they, they die off because the weather is cold. And this here, of course, there is no climate change. <laughs> There's that political side again. Anyway, climate, the change in climate, whether it's real or not, presents a real big threat. Because bees will, when it's warm, come out. And if it's warm before the buds and the flowers are presented, they have no food. And then they'll start flying around and dying because of the lack of nutrition. And then also, the pollination is off kilter. And of course, our own addition to all of this in a big way is the loss of habitat by the urbanization landscape. So if you do live in a row house, perhaps you can put a little garden in or something, you know. Pesticide use, the neonicotinoids are suspected, and this is this blew me away. Fifty-seven different pesticides discovered in poisoned honeybees. <clears throat> so, six ways you can help the bees: um, plants and flowers, use of chemicals. <coughs> Support local sustainable farmers, local honey, make a bee hotel. Just take straws, put them in a can, hang it up, and the native bees will form little pockets in there. And here are bees that are nuisance because they create between second and third floor in the soffits, in a cabinet left on the porch. Oops. Uh, they went in through the top there and were behind the barn board under the house. There's a buzz in my ear, dear. Oh yeah, and that comfortable chair on the porch. <laughs> so. Oh! Uh, that's available in downtown Montpelier. Wow. <laughs> Those are drones? <laughs> yes, most of them are drones. <laughs> so, 12 plus 2,600 2, plus 850 is equal to 1. How would you make that equation work? 12 bees visiting 2,600 flowers and flying a total of 850 miles create one teaspoon of honey. So if you eat honey, do not be wasteful. That's a lot of work went into it. 850 miles is approximately from here to Chicago. Just to give it perspective. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm a little over time.